The writer of this story has been dead for several years now. At one time, back in the early 30s, he had this story written up, ready to send away. Something happened, and the manuscript was put into a box and forgotten. The story should be listed among the classics, for it occurred before anything was known about Bigfoot, before anyone knew anything about these things. Anyone except the natives, that is, and they have known all along. But no one listened until the 21st century. Thomas Bay, Alaska, 1900. The spring of 1900 found four men batching together in a shack at Wrangell, Alaska. All four were broke, as is usual with prospectors. As luck would have it, I was one of the four. For reasons which will be quite obvious, I will just call the other three men John, Charlie, and Fred. Charlie came into the shack one night in April. He was all excited, and he said, Fellas, I've been on the trail of an Indian for the past month trying to get him to tell me where he picked up a piece of free gold quartz that he keeps in his camp. I never said anything about it before because I wanted to get the story from him first, and today he spilled the beans. He told me to go up to Thomas Bay and camp on the Patterson River on the right side, then to travel upriver for about eight miles and then turn to the high mountains, and after traveling about a mile and a half, I would find a lake shaped like a half moon. He said, there's plenty of stone like this where I found this one. Thomas Bay is known by the Native Americans in Alaska as the Bay of Death. About 150 years ago, a slide down one of the mountains wiped out a village, killing over 500 of the inhabitants. Of course, a prospector is ready to stampede on a whisper of gold anywhere, and we were no exceptions to the rule. We all talked the matter over, and finally it was decided that we would run our races for the outfit and send Charlie to look the prospect over. While he was gone, John, Fred, and myself would hustle up work somewhere for another grub stake and to pay the old one off. Around the 1st of May, Charlie loaded his outfit into his canoe, having favorable weather. He left Wrangell for Thomas Bay, which lies northwesterly about 50 miles. He had three months' worth of supplies, but was to come back at any time sooner if he found anything. But if he didn't show up at that time, we were to put out and search for him. John and Fred took a contract to get out wood, and I got a job at the Wrangell Sawmill. Things went along until the first part of June, when, on a Sunday in the late afternoon, we all being at home, and in walks Charlie without a coat or hat and looking as if he had been through hell. He didn't give us any greeting whatsoever. He just heaved a piece of quartz over into a corner of the room, and he said, Get me something to eat. I'm done for the day, and I want some rest. The fellow looked it, and after he had eaten, he turned in without telling us a thing about his trip. We picked up the piece of quartz, and boy, it sure was a pretty thing to look at for our prospector. It was shot through with gold specks, just like a badly freckled-faced kid. Were we excited? I'll say we were. Just before dark, we walked down to the beach to help Charlie bring his outfit in, as he had come up to the shack with only that piece of quartz in his hand, but there wasn't a thing in his canoe except his oars. There was not much sleep for us that night, but Charlie never stopped sawing wood. We had to work hard to get Charlie up for breakfast the next morning, but when he did roll out, he just ate, he borrowed a coat and a hat, and he left the house without saying a word or even answering one question out of the many put to him by us. All of us being excited and feeling ourselves worth a fortune, 
We didn't go to work that day, but we sat around the shack and passed that blame piece of rock back and forth to each other while we talked and waited for Charlie to come back and make his report. Believe me, we were anxious to hear it. Along in the afternoon, he came in and he said, Fellas, the SS Drigo will be in on her way south early tomorrow morning. Can you give me enough money for my ticket to Seattle? I'm through with Alaska, and I never want to see it again. I'll tell you about my trip to Thomas Bay and where I found that quartz, but my advice to you is to forget about it. It will never do you any good, and it will only cause you a lot of mental and physical pain. If we were not partners, I would never open my mouth about this trip or what I found. But if you promise never to mention my name in connection with what I'm about to tell you, or mention the name of Thomas Bay to me ever again, I'll give you the straight up of my experience up there. Judge for yourself as to my saneness, because this is the most astounding thing you will ever hear. And as far as I'm concerned, it is beyond me to reason it out. Don't ask any questions to prolong my story any longer than it takes me to tell it, as I want to leave Alaska and forget it if I can. I will try to make the one telling plain enough. And Charlie proceeded to tell us his story. The first night after leaving Wrangell found me an ideal cove. The next night I reached Muddy River in time to make camp once again. The third night, I hit Ruth Island in Thomas Bay. I spent the next day looking up the Patterson River for a suitable place to camp, which I found a quarter mile up from the tidewater on the right-hand side, looking up the river. I broke camp on Ruth Island the next day, and I moved up to a place I picked out the day before. I put up my tent, packed up my outfit, and left the canoe on the river bank. The next day, I spent cooking beans, cutting wood, and making things comfortable for a long stay. And then it started raining. I wanted to get things fixed up so I could keep dry. It started to rain that night and kept raining for days. I lost track of time as each day was just like the one before. I had nothing to read. I was all alone. I couldn't do anything without getting soaked and the roar of the river and the wind through the timber just about drove me crazy, so I put in most of my time sleeping. Finally, the weather broke and I got out. I spent several days in trying to find the old Indian's half-moon lake, but I couldn't get it spotted. I did find about two miles from camp up the river and about a mile from it a lake shaped like the letter S. On the creek coming out from the lower end, I panned some pretty good colors, but as I figured, not enough to get excited about, yet an indication of gold in the country. There doesn't seem to be any life in there at all. You might spend all day in the timber without seeing even a squirrel. I was getting sort of tired of beans, rice, and bacon so I made up my mind that I would go over to a ridge about eight miles east of S Lake and get a few grouse. I left the next morning, which was a fine sunny day. I took only the rifle with me, and when I came to the ridge, sure enough, there were a few grouse hooting. I shot two and had gotten them when I bagged another one, which fell down the ridge about a hundred yards before it got hung up. While on my way down to pick it up, I found the piece of quartz. Up until that time, I had paid very little attention to what the country I was in looked like, as it was so heavily timbered and brushy. The formation didn't show up, and I had no tools with me to uncover it. The top of an old snag had broken off and fallen, scraping the top moss and loose dirt for a space of about 8 feet wide and 18 to 20 feet long. Uncovering this quartz ledge, which is where I found this piece. The ledge was worked smooth by a glacier at one time. I couldn't find anything to break a piece off with, so I used the butt of my gun to get that piece. 
In so doing, I broke the stock of my gun, thus ruining it for further use. This didn't worry me any, as I knew there was not any game in this country larger than a grouse, and there were damn few of them. My first thought was of the richness of the quartz and of you fellas in getting back to town to round you all up so we could get busy on the claim. After resting a minute and enjoying the feeling of knowing I had made a rich find, I covered the ledge up again with moss, limbs, and a rotten chunk. Finishing that job, I thought I would climb the ridge directly over the ledge and get my landmarks so I could come back to it again or tell you where it was if anything should happen to me. This I did, climbing straight up over the ledge on the ridge until I reached the top, which was about 600 feet above where I had found the ledge. I looked down below me and picked out a big tree with a bushy top, taller than the rest, about 50 feet to the right of the ledge. Looking over the top of this tree from where I stood, I could see out on Frederick Sound, the point of Vanderput Spit, and turning a little to the left, I could see Sukhoi Island from the mouth of the Wrangell Narrows. Satisfied with that, I turned half around to get a backsight on some mountain peaks, and laying below me on the other side of the ridge from the ledge was the half-moon lake the Indian had told me about. Right there, fellows, is when I got the scare of my life, and I hope to God I never see or go through the likes of it again. Swarming up the ridge towards me from the lake were the most hideous creatures. I couldn't call them anything but devils, because they were neither men nor monkeys, yet they looked like both. They were entirely sexless, their bodies covered with long, coarse hair, except where the scabs and running swords had replaced it. Each one seemed to be reaching out for me and striving to be the first to get me. The air was full of their cries, and the stench from their sores and bodies made me faint. I forgot my broken gun, and I tried to use it on the first ones, and then I threw it at them and turned, and I ran. God, how did I run? I could feel their hot breath on my back. Their long, claw-like fingers scraped my back. The smell from their steaming, stinking bodies was making me sick, while the noises they made, yelling and screaming and breathing, drove me mad. All reason left me. And how I reached the canoe, or how I hung on to that piece of quartz, is a mystery to me. The rest of that episode is a blank to me. When I came to, it was night, and I was lying in the bottom of my canoe, drifting between Thomas Bay and Sukhoi Island, cold, hungry, and crazy for a drink of water. But only to satisfy the latter urge, I started for Wrangell, and here I am. You no doubt think that I'm either crazy or lying. All I can say is, there is the quartz. And never let me hear the name of Thomas Bay again, and for God's sake, help me get away tomorrow on that boat. And so passed out Charlie from our lives. We put his story down as fantasy caused by loneliness or morbid thoughts. But the question that has haunted me since this writing is, what if this story is true. Hey everybody, it's Friday morning. I'm real busy at work. I just came in from weed eating uh, about half of my yard and I've got grass all over me. Okay, let's get to these stories. This one is from Linda and I thought this was really good. My husband and I live in Alaska. We've traveled the Alcan Highway through Canada many times. At the end of July in 2016, we were coming back up the Alcan, heading home to Alaska from Oregon. We always share the driving on these trips. One drives while the other sleeps. And on that day, I hadn't been feeling well. So while my husband drove, I was sleeping in the back seat of our crew cab pickup truck. It was late at night, and we were in a really remote area of either British Columbia or the Yukon Territory. My husband pulled into a gravel pullout on the side of the road and he woke me up. He said he was exhausted and he needed to get some sleep. He grabbed a blanket and pillow and climbed into the front seat to take a nap. 
I drifted back to sleep too. And sometime later, I woke up in a panic to the sound of what I thought was a child saying, No, no, I don't want to. I looked out the back passenger window and then back and then the back window, but I didn't see anything. I leaned over the front seat, looked out the passenger side mirror, and then I looked in the front out the front windshield, and I leaned back and I slid over to look out the driver's side and then through the driver's side mirror and I saw nothing. No one was anywhere near our truck or the flatbed trailer we were hauling. There were no vehicles on the road or in the pullout area, and I couldn't see anything in the woods or on either side of the road. I did not roll down any windows to look out, and the sense of urgency to leave was getting stronger, and I woke my husband up. There's something wrong here, I told him. We need to leave right now. He didn't question me. He started the truck, and we left immediately. And as we drove down the road, I told him what had happened, what I'd heard, and what I was feeling. We've been together for many years, and he's always told me to trust my instincts, and he trusts my intuition. For years, I've tried to make sense out of the question, why would a child be out in that remote area? Things have crossed my mind, none of them having anything to do with Bigfoot or cryptids of any kind. And when I started to listen to your Dixie Cryptid stories, things started to fall into place. The overwhelming panic that I felt, the urgency to leave, and what sounded like a child, things that so many others have written to you about, I'm not saying it was Bigfoot, but I'm not saying it wasn't either. I know there are creatures and entities living here on Earth that not all of, that not all of us are aware of. Even though we think some animals are extinct, some are not. They're still living in remote areas. My husband once saw a saber-toothed tiger in the middle of the road while we travel the Alcan late at night. But that's a story for another time. You saw a saber-toothed tiger? Are you kidding me? A saber-toothed tiger? Wow. Those have been extinct for, I think, since the, uh, since the Ice Age. But that would be pretty unusual to see one of those. But, you know, these things happen. People hear things. And it's quite rational, in my mind, to uh, with uh, the knowledge of all these stories, to connect that with Bigfoot. It's quite possible. I don't know. But uh, it was a great story anyway. And what a fun life you guys live, traveling up and down the uh, west coast of North America. Oh, man, I, w- I would love to. I'd love to do that on a motorcycle. Okay, uh, let's go to another story. Boop. I've got another one. These are a little longer than the little shorts I've been doing. So, And I'm doing them cold, so I'm messing up a little bit. But just hang with me. Still telling the story. This person doesn't say whether I can use her name, so I won't. But it's a it's a strange event. She claims it's true. This this is a little bit sad. Just just get your little handkerchiefs ready and your Kleenexes to dab your eyes. This first paragraph is going to wear you out. These last few years haven't been easy for anyone. Our story is no different. In 2019, before the whole world had a meltdown, my husband suffered a massive heart attack in our backyard, and he died right in front of us before the paramedics arrived. He was the great love of my life. Losing him was devastating. I don't know that I'll ever get over it. If not for my dear, sweet, beautiful Australian cattle-slash-husky mix, I don't know how I could have survived. She's the other great love of my life, and this is her story. Ma'am, I I just want to say I'm so sorry you had to deal with that. And uh, none of us get out of here alive, but it's just, it's bad when, uh, this is just a tough story. Okay, all right. Her name is Crystal Blue Persuasion because of her beautiful blue eyes, but we call her Mama. She was born in the basement of our home in North Ogden, Utah, in 2018, and it was love at first sight. She's been my constant companion and a great comfort to me these last few years. So as you might imagine, when I thought I'd lost her a mere six months after my husband died, I didn't think my heart could survive it. It all happened around midnight in February of 2020. A massive storm was moving in and the snow had already been falling for an hour when Mama wanted to go outside. I let her out the back door and I watched her jump off the porch. 
The bright snow bathed in the night in a soft glow that illuminated everything. Although it was cold out, obviously cold enough to snow, it was warmer than normal, and I went back to my room to get a cigarette. I was only gone for a minute, but when I returned, I couldn't see Mama anywhere, and I called her name several times, but she didn't come bounding across the, lo- the yard like I expected. I listened for her bark, but I didn't hear anything. Here, Mama, I called again. There was nothing. This wasn't like her. She normally doesn't go very far. The road was well lit by the blanket of white, but I'm afraid of the dark, so I wasn't going out there by myself, and I woke my roommate and asked him to go out with me to find Mama. Let's go follow her footprints from where she jumped off the porch, he said, and we stepped out into the night. Great idea, I thought. We followed her prints around to the backyard and to the chain-link fence that separates our yard from the neighbor's. There it appeared she had gone under the fence and took maybe two or three steps onto the other side, and then they stopped completely. There isn't anything in the neighbor's backyard. There are no trees, no bushes, not even a hole. It's just a flat piece of earth with a fence around it. There was nothing there that Mama could have been hiding behind, and nothing she could have jumped to from that spot. Her prints just came to an abrupt halt in the middle of the snow and it was as if she had vanished. It was impossible. My roommate, who was in his 70s, sank to the ground and grabbed his head. Patty, I can't wrap my mind around this, he said as he rocked back and forth. I just can't get my head around this. Well, I couldn't answer. I was too busy mentally running through every possible scenario that could have made my dog vanish on the spot. Was it an alien abduction? Was it magic? There was no reasonable explanation for what we were looking at. The icy hand of terror grabbed my heart as I fought off the panic attack. Where was my girl? I couldn't lose her too. We scoured every inch of the one and a half acre lot going as far as we could, calling her name and whistling and doing everything we could to flush her out. We didn't see or hear anything from her, and an hour passed. And the snow was filling in the old footprints, and we didn't find any new ones. I was near hysterics as we covered the entire street that we lived on, but we still found nothing. And finally, we returned to the backyard to her last footprints. I think we'd better split up, my roommate said. We'll cover more ground that way. I'm terrified of the dark, but the thought of not finding my dog outweighed that fear, so I nodded. And by now, we were both covered in snow, and my feet were freezing, and my mind was racing. I was so afraid for my dog. Just as my roommate turned to move away from me, she appeared right in front of us. She just showed up. She was happy to see me as if I was the one who had gone somewhere and just returned home. And when I bent down to hug her, I realized immediately that she was bone dry. Even the pads of her feet were dry. My roommate and I were soaked through and freezing after an hour in the weather, but she looked like she had just stepped outside. Come on, let's get inside now, my roommate said as he shot me a worried glance around the yard. He pushed me forward to hurry me up, and we ran up up to the house and into the back door, and after closing it and locking it, he turned to me and he said, I don't know. I just don't know what to think about this. In answer to the question I hadn't asked yet. Check her, Patty. Make sure she's okay. Then he left me alone with the dog. I don't know what happened to her that night, and I don't know where she went. At first, I was convinced that she'd been abducted by aliens. But as time went on, I began to entertain the possibility that she had somehow slipped into another dimension and had somehow been lucky enough to slip back. It leads to more questions than I can begin to answer. I am certain of this, that I can't take one second with her for granted. Every night I raise my eyes upward and I say a prayer. Thank you for bringing my dog back, and please don't ever take her from me again. She needs me, and I need her. It's the same prayer I uttered to the night sky the night she came home. There you go. That's a, uh, for some reason that story sounds familiar like I've done it before, but if I had, if I have, you just get to hear it again. 
I, I have trouble with so many of these that I'm, I put them in the wrong folders and I pull them up and I start reading them and I'm thinking, oh, this sounds familiar. But it may sound familiar because I've read through it before and I can never discern which one it is. But anyway, after that video yesterday, uh, look, sometimes the videos are going to bomb and sometimes they're going to be popular and sometimes they're going to have good stories and sometimes they're going to have less than good stories and um you know i should be a little more diligent about what they are but i made a promise to someone that i would get a story podcast up and uh again i know i'm doing things a little different uh the last couple of weeks but it has a little bit to do with my workload i've got this uh big big building that i'm working on right now and i've got to get it done in the next two weeks and we've got our gatlinburg conference uh the smoky mountain bigfoot conference coming up in a couple of weeks i don't know if there are still tickets available for the gatlinburg but if you get a chance i'd love to see you there and it's a pretty fun time there are tons of booths and speakers and i don't know any of them i don't i looked through the speaker list and i was thinking I don't know who any of these people are, but I think it's because I really don't follow the circuit. You know, there's a circuit of Bigfoot people, and I kind of try to stay out of that. I just like the stories. I don't want to be involved in the proof or the research. Or I know a bunch of researchers, and I really like those guys and girls, but it's just not up my alley. I don't. I don't have that much time and I don't really have that much interest in the existence or non-existence of Bigfoot. I just love the stories about Bigfoot and UFOs, anything strange. And so I'll invite you. Uh, traditionally, this channel has been um, strictly Bigfoot. And I did that because whenever I would veer off that path, all the Bigfoot people would have a fit. And so I thought, well... You know, I didn't know much about YouTube, so I just kept doing Bigfoot stuff, to kind of appeasing the people. And a Bigfoot story is just as good to me as an alien story or a UFO story or a dogman story or whatever. But um, I kind of got a taste, I, you know, through the next couple of years, I got a taste of who the Bigfoot people are, the real, the real adamant, staunch... Uh, I don't know what's the word you know the bigfoot people it's their religion and they're they're a vicious bunch of people and they never did me any favors and so i'm doing all stories i'm not just sticking to bigfoot because i stuck with bigfoot just to make them happy and uh so i, I had a guy named matt moneymaker on and they treated me like a piece of dirt for having the guy on and i thought I'm, I'm not going to kiss their ass anymore. I'm going to do what I want to do. So that's what I'm doing. Like this last story was, uh, and if you, and, and I may drop a couple of more stories after this. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you, I will, um, I'll find a couple of other stories and it may not be, you may not see me reading them, but they're, uh, previous recordings I've done on another uh, on uh, on the What If It's True podcast and I'll put them in this Dixie Cryptid video. You guys hope you enjoy it. Alright, I didn't mean to go off on that. Just kind of giving you an update of why I'm doing this stuff but before long I'll be done with this job in a couple, three weeks and everything will be just uh, chickens and me reading a story. But if you'll be patient with me and deal with this, this is a quick way to do this. Read them cold, no edit. Just bust it out there and that's what I'm doing. All right, we're going to jump in and do a couple other stories, and when they end, the podcast will be over. I love you guys, and uh, after these two stories, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. The title of the story is The Ghost Demons of Prescott. The story begins in a place called Prescott, Arizona, a rather unique city commissioned by President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. President Lincoln sent a delegation to the Arizona Territory to establish a capital. A site adjacent to Fort Whipple was selected and given the name Prescott in honor of William H. Prescott, author of the history of the conquest of Mexico. 
When Arizona won statehood in 1914, Prescott became the first Arizona state capital. In 1968, my family moved to Prescott. I was going to be a junior in high school, and Prescott seemed to me to be really small and with not a lot of entertainment options for teenagers. When such is the situation, teenagers can get really creative. At least they could in the 1960s. One summer night after church, a family with teenage daughters invited us to their place for refreshments and fellowship. While the parents visited out front, the two girls invited the teenagers to the back room for a little Ouija board action. I'd seen this Ouija board thing before. It was something that, for me, never actually worked, and this time was no exception. The sisters opened up the board, they lit a candle and turned out the lights, and laid their fingertips on the stylus and began calling on the great Ouija to answer a few simple questions. With a handful of onlookers gathered in the darkness around the table, Ouija did nothing. I mean nothing. This is exactly what I experienced every time some kid would drag out a Ouija board. The two sisters that summer night insisted their Ouija board work for them without fail. Why parents would allow the girls to dabble in such demonic tools is beyond me. It should not have been there in that home. It is important to point out that these little Ouija boards are nothing to mess with. They can provide a foothold for a portal for evil entities to come into a home. As I got older, I thought about this incident and I realized why the board probably didn't work that night. Many of the teenagers who were there were actually real Christians. I believe old Ouija was powerless to show up due to the presence of God's angels surrounding and protecting us from evil. High school started in the fall, and I met a great buddy, a guy named Louie. He's one of those people who brings a smile to your face with every remembrance. Having lived in Prescott his whole life, Louie had a laundry list of crazy things to do on Friday and Saturday nights. One of his favorite pastimes was trying to scare the girls who happened to be with us. Invariably, he would suggest we venture to what we considered to be the haunted areas of Prescott. This included a famous spot east of town called the Baby Grave. It was reputed that one could hear the sound of a baby's mother crying on a moonlit night. That never happened when we visited. We didn't hear a mother crying, and we didn't even hear a baby either. But it was fun to get the girls out there and creep around in the dark. It was kind of spooky, and it gave us the willies. One night, Louie decided we needed to get serious about escalating our spooky adventures. There were four of us. It was me, Louie, Louie's sister Dolores, and her girlfriend Susie. The four of us piled in the front seat of Louie's stepside pickup truck and we drove to an old cemetery. Although it was well past dark, the cemetery gate was standing wide open. No one tended this deserted place. Louie cranked the wheel and pulled off Sheldon Street and smack into the center of what could be labeled Spookville, USA. The truck tires crackled on the gravel driveway as we slowly made our way deep into the center of ancient gravestones. Tall weeds and overgrown trees and bushes had taken over. This place was definitely creepy and immediately invoked the willies. Louie drove us to the back of the graveyard and turned the truck around, being careful not to drive over any actual grave plots. Once the truck was facing the gate, Louie stopped and announced that we were now getting out to look at some old gravestones. Seriously? I was already freaked out. Louie's sister Dolores flatly refused to get out of the truck. There was no way she was getting out. No way. Not happening. Louie, Susie, and I got out, and we stepped into the darkness and we left Dolores behind by herself in the truck. She was a little bit spooked. The three of us began cautiously prowling about like some adventurers from the Raiders of the Lost Ark. 
There was no light except for the moon, and it was difficult trying to read what was etched into the gravestones. When we reached the west side of the graveyard and bent around the front of a gravestone to see what was written there, we got the ultimate scare of our lives. As we bent forward to look at the gravestone, suddenly an opaque, iridescent lime green, absolutely hideous man's face came straight out of the gravestone in our direction. It scared us so badly that Susie screeched abruptly and Louie cried out in horror. The three of us turned on our heels and bolted like lightning back to the truck. With the truck doors flying open, we dove into the cab, hit the ignition, and ripped out of the graveyard, throwing gravel from the back tires all the way to the front gate. When we got about a quarter mile down Shelton Street, Louie finally caught his breath and he gasped. What was that? My answer was quick and final. I don't know, but I'm never going back to another graveyard ever again, especially at night and especially with you. What we saw that night in a Prescott graveyard was definitely a demon. If there was ever a doubt in my mind that demons existed anywhere beyond the pages of the Bible, I had just experienced a startling revelation. Demons do exist, and I had just seen one. The sight of that evil thing is still etched in my mind to this day. Throughout my life, that single event has kept me vigilant to never allow a foothold or portal for any of these beings in my life or the lives of my family. I took it especially seriously when my kids were growing up. If there was anything questionable that showed up in the house, it was thrown out immediately. I wanted to keep the kids safe, just in case there were any hitchhiking evil entities attached to those questionable things. Ten years ago, while living in a rental property, I became aware of the presence of a ghost in my home. It was probably left behind by the previous resident. At night, whatever this thing was, it would come into my bedroom and cause the hair on my arms to stand up with goosebumps and just generally give me the creeps. I would hide under the covers and hope that it would go away. Imagine that, a grown man hiding under the covers. I thought maybe it would get tired of hanging around and eventually move on. I had no luck at that. It just kept hanging around and it freaked me out fairly frequently, mostly after dark when I was in bed trying to get some sleep. But while living there, I got a request from a friend who needed a place to land for a short time, so I let her stay in the guest bedroom. A few weeks after she was gone, the weirdest thing happened. While home alone, I walked into the hallway in the middle of the day and I smelled that gal's perfume in the air. What? Why am I smelling her perfume? She's been gone for weeks. That was the last straw. I was sure it was another manifestation of a demon. I called a Christian buddy and asked him to come over and help in praying that the Lord would get rid of this evil thing. My buddy came over, we prayed, and the ghost was gone. From that day forward, I never had another creepy visit from the rental ghost. Another ghost issue came up about six years ago. I was working at a private golf club. Hanging out there in the men's locker room was a particularly pesky and annoying demon. It would make itself known any time I had to go into the men's locker room by myself, especially at night. I would feel its presence and the hair on my arms would stand up with goosebumps like crazy. It really annoyed me. My co-worker, the cleaning lady from the maintenance department, also complained about this thing. She was bilingual and referred to it as la fantasma, the Spanish word for ghost. I believe this evil entity came in with some Kachina dolls that were on display in the locker room. Kachinas are one of those items that I personally would not have around. I think they provide a portal or foothold for demons. At least that's what I believe. Manifestations of the golf club ghost got so bad that even the manager in the lounge complained. 
The ghostly thing opened a sliding patio door one night after she had closed and locked it. She was there by herself late at night closing up. Everyone was gone except her. Her routine was to go around checking all the doors to make sure they were all locked. When she came back into the lounge, the sliding door leading out to the patio that she had just closed and locked was now standing open. It was very freaky. Workers from the pro shop also reported problems with this evil thing. It was overseed time. Overseed is when a golf course shuts down for a couple of weeks to make the transition between summer grass and winter grass. With the golfers gone, the pro shop gets new displays and any changes needed in anticipation of the golfer's return once the grass is ready. The pro shop guys had set up a new clothing display one day, closed and locked the pro shop doors, and they went to lunch. When they came back, they found the new clothing display knocked over. It was very annoying, especially when no one else was around and the pro shop was locked until they returned. They set up the display again and went outside the pro shop to their storage area. When they returned a few minutes later, the display was overturned again. A real nuisance, this demon was. Knowing the demon was always hanging around the men's locker room, I decided to torture it a bit. When I walked into that area by myself and I felt the goose pumps coming up on my arm, I would start singing some good old Christian hit songs like Amazing Grace and When We All Get to Heaven. I was just messing with the ghost, you know. I'm guessing it didn't appreciate my song selections or my singing. Either one was probably pure torture. This whole golf club ghost situation finally came to a head one morning when my coworker and I were folding tablecloths. We were at the linen closet just inside the men's locker room, quietly working away with our folding. What we knew to be an empty locker room except for us suddenly had somebody else in it. We could hear noise on the other side of the golf lockers to my right. Those lockers stood about seven feet tall, so there was no seeing over them, but we could hear somebody on the other side. Knowing well that we had a demon in that locker room, we both looked at each other with our eyes as wide open as they would go. We either had a golfer over there that we didn't know about, or it was the demon. My co-worker whispered, La Fantasma. Not sure what to do, we both continued to work in complete silence, wondering whether it was a golfer that we didn't know about, or was it the demon? It didn't take long until there was more rustling on the other side of the lockers. This time, it sounded like someone was fiddling with something inside of the locker. That was it. I had to go around the corner and check. I walked around, and there was no one there. No one. The ghost was at it again. It had gotten to be such a nuisance that I determined to go to the general manager and report the problem. I recommended that we remove the Kachina dolls and see if that would make a difference. Over the weekend, I had dinner with a Christian gal who worked for Southwest Airlines. I told her about what was going on in the men's locker room at the golf club. When I expressed my concern and what I was planning to do after that weekend, my friend suggested, why don't we just pray and ask the Lord to sweep that thing out of here? Then, without hesitation, she began praying and asked Jesus to get that evil thing out of there. When I went back on Monday, the demon was gone. Later, there was a remodel in the men's locker room and the kachinas were disposed of. I worked there for two more years and the evil entity, the golf club ghost, never came back. Once again, it was amazing to me the power of prayer even from a long distance away. These evil entities are no match for the Lord. One last incident. While visiting with a lady friend from the west side of town, she was complaining about ghosts in her family's cabin at South Lake Tahoe. Several of the family members had seen these things over the years, and she had also seen them as recently as the previous summer. There were two of them. 
She said they looked like dark shadows as they moved across the main room of the cabin. She was there alone, and the appearance of these two evil entities was unnerving, to say the least. She hollered at them, telling them to give her a break and please move on. Now it was getting close to her vacation, and she was headed for Tahoe again, and not looking forward to encountering the cabin ghosts. Without my friend from the west side knowing, I later called the guy who had helped me pray the demon out of the rental property. The same guy, but a different ghost. He and I prayed together over the phone that these two creepy cabin ghosts would be removed from my lady friend's family cabin in South Lake Tahoe. When she came back from her summer vacation, I asked her if she had seen any of the cabin ghosts this year. She said, no, I didn't see them at all this year. She had no idea that two guys had prayed, asking Jesus to sweep those demons out. It's amazing to me that the Lord hears and answers our prayers, even in these really creepy situations. In closing, if you're having issues with ghosts, demons, or evil entities in your home or business, go through the place with a critical eye and see what might possibly be providing a portal or a foothold. If you find anything that looks like it might be remotely responsible, throw it out. Then have a Christian friend pray with you, asking the Lord to sweep out whatever evil entity might be hanging around. Things will change. And if you haven't done so, invite Jesus into your life. Your life will be better. John 3, 16. I was heavy into racing in the mid-70s. I'd been asked to tune a flat-bottom circle boat in the SK class. They were headed to the World Championships to defend their number one title of the previous year. I was asked to come along by my friend Dan, the guy who built the engine, to work on the tuning and the fuel. As usual, with racing parts, people, and shops, nothing ever lines up to get you on your way to the races on time. To make matters worse, we had a 7 a.m. Saturday morning tech time to meet. That was almost six hours away. On Friday night, we found ourselves starting the new motor for the first time at 11 p.m. We set the timing, jumped in Dan's Silverado crew cab, and lit out for Phoenix from Santa Ana, California, with six hours to get there and sleep a bit before tech inspection while towing a flat-bottom race boat with a monstrous motor in it. Since I was the only coffee drinker in the bunch, I had guzzled a gallon in the course of prepping the motor that night. It was decided that I would drive the first leg to Phoenix. Everybody else would sleep until it was their time to get behind the wheel. I asked Dan how fast he wanted me to tow with his truck. He and the boat owner debated and then told me that 90 miles per hour would be fine. The truck had a 500 cubic inch big block in it. Apparently, gas mileage wasn't a concern. When I cleared the inner city freeways, I took it to 90 and I set the cruise control. We made it to Palm Springs by 12.15 a.m. That was fast considering we were towing a heavy load through a mountain pass. At the other end of Palm Springs is Scirocco Summit, a 19-mile-long 6% grade usually strewn with big rigs in the right lane, plugging along at 40 miles an hour. This night there weren't many, and I was able to slalom my way around them at 70 to 80 miles per hour. There was no worry of anyone in the truck complaining as they had all fallen asleep within 10 minutes of leaving home base, including my shotgun keep-me-awake guy, Bobby. He was in full drool mode, slumped against the door. I was still amped up on caffeine, so I decided to roll on past the first leg until someone became coherent and took the wheel from me. As we passed the top of the grade, it was a downhill run for 20 miles to Desert Center, which has only a cafe and some vacant buildings. Highway 10 is one desolate stretch of road. The occasional semi-rig we passed was the only sign of life. 
In my usual watch the sky mode, I noticed a bright green star out past the mountaintops on my right, about seven miles away. I didn't think much of it, and I didn't watch it for very long. But ten minutes later, I looked back and I saw that it was still directly out the passenger window, not moving behind where I had first seen it. That was strange, and I kept my eye on the green light. There were no aircraft running lights or strobes, and it kept pace with the truck as I traveled. I realized it was no longer on the other side of the mountaintops. It was on my side, and the mountains were behind it. It was now clearly pacing the truck a quarter mile away. I slowed down to 60, and it slowed down, and when I sped up, it sped up. All I could make out was this bright green glowing object. There was no discernible shape. I shoved Bobby to wake him up. What? Where are we? He asked. I pointed out the window and I said, never mind that. Look at that thing. Just as he began to turn his head, this thing made a left turn and it came blazing straight at the truck. What the hell? Bobby yelled. It was coming right at the truck, and I braced myself for impact. I slowed, and I held the wheel tight. And then it was by so fast that I pulled my foot off the accelerator and hadn't been able to put on the brake before it had disappeared to our left. This happened in less than a second, almost instantaneously. I fully expected a vortex turbulence to blast the truck at any moment but none ever came. How it missed the truck, we had no idea. This thing was going at least a thousand miles per hour if it was going one. It literally looked like a 75-foot diameter green blur as it passed the front of the truck, and the backseat boys never even woke up. Bobby and I rode in silence for a mile or two, and he finally said, Are we going to tell the other guys about this? Hell to the no, I said. They're going to think we're crazy or full of it. He agreed, and in ten minutes, he was sound asleep again. Me, on the other hand, I was adrenaline amp to the bejesus belt. Between my gallon of coffee and the adrenaline rush, I could have run to Phoenix at that point. Not wanting to stare at the ceiling in the truck the rest of the way, I kept pushing that 500 cubic inch that was under the hood of the Chevrolet. With the hum of the engine and the highway lanes snapping past, I think I went into autopilot mode. I was shocked out of my trance when a CB radio barked at me. I almost jumped out of my skin. Hey, Seifer, where's the fire? It crackled in a southern accent. Seifer is what truckers call the guys pulling boats in California. Registration numbers for Cali boats started with the letters CF. Dazed, I grabbed the mic and I said, Ah, we're late for the races in Phoenix. His reply was, Well, I ain't seen a Smokey for a while coming your way, but you better watch your speed. Besides, you're almost there anyway. I looked over at the speedometer and I was rolling at a 100 miles per hour. How had I gotten to this speed? And he was right. I was coming up on the lake exit in two miles. I looked at my watch and it read 245. A.M. When the craft passed in front of us at Desert Center, it was 1.30 a.m. From there, we were an easy three hours from our destination. We rolled into the hotel at 3 a.m. I woke everyone up. They were all trying to figure out how we got to the hotel in four hours, especially towing that big-ass boat. The trip was 382 miles on the odometer. I would have had to average 90 to 95 miles per hour to make it in that time frame. From Desert Center to Phoenix is 197 miles, and I had made it in an hour and a half. That section alone would have required me to be flying at around 135 miles per hour. Even creepier was the fuel consumption. We should have run out of gas long before Phoenix. 
With only 50 gallons on board and the truck's usual 6 miles per gallon towing at 65, we would have been 70 miles short. As fast as I was driving, towing that big boat 4 miles per gallon should have been great. If I thought the weirdness had passed, I was wrong as wrong could be. I finally fell asleep around 3.30 a.m., or I passed out from the letdown off of adrenaline and caffeine. At 6, I was shaken awake by Dan, and he was asking me, what the hell happened to my truck? I looked at him and I said, I don't know. I never stopped, so nothing that I know of. He insisted that I get out of the truck and come look at the front end. I dragged my worn ass out to the front of the truck to see that the chrome and the paint on the front end was all bubbled up. Bobby walked over and took a peek, and then he grabbed his head and he said, Oh, damn, man, I thought I had dreamed that. The other guys were confused, so we related the story to them. They were incredulous, as we expected. But we had to get to the tech inspection, and there was no time for a debate. On the way to the lake, I started running some math through my mind. Hey, Dan, how much gas is left in the tank? He looked down at the gauge and he said there was a quarter of a tank and asked where I had stopped to fill up. I told him I had never stopped for gas. How could I have with the time that I made? We finished our day and the boat ran fine. And not much was said until dinner on Sunday night in Buckeye, Arizona. Dan, being an engine builder, was no slouch at math and had been doing his own calculations. It was at dinner that night that we decided that we would never speak of the trip's details again. When we had to stop for fuel on the way back, despite having filled up in Phoenix, we all looked at each other and we shook our heads. None of us have any idea where the time or the miles went. I only know when the trucker coming the other way woke me from my trance, I wasn't aware of where we were or how we had gotten there. <laughs>